Thank you everyone for joining us for part four of the Regional Behavior Support Review Committee series that um, we have put out there. I just have a couple housekeeping items. Um, they're the same as always. Muted upon entry, make sure that you mute your line as well. I know that on a recent webinar, um, we had someone that even experienced a little feedback even though I had muted everyone. So good practice, go ahead and mute your line. Um, I will turn this over to today's presenters and they will give you not only that quick introduction of themselves, but directions for responding today. And good morning from Jefferson City. You've got the area behavior analysts here. Um, I'm Rita Cooper, the Western Region Area Behavior Analyst. And this is Melantha Witherspoon, the Eastern Area Behavior Analyst, and Lucas Evans will be joining us shortly. Yes, and let's put out some other housekeeping and um, requirements for everyone. Uh, remember, if you want to get CEUs for this, you will need to um, enter in the question and answer portion your name, your uh, BCBA number, your email address. You will also then need to ensure that you um, answer the questions in the Q&A box and then at the end of the presentation indicate that you have signed out. So. Um, again, I'll repeat that so we've got it all in place. Oh, I see we've got some people complying. Good compliance there. Um, name, BCBA number, and email address. Answer the questions in the Q&A and then um, sign out at the end. So without um, going much further, we'll give everyone a, a couple of minutes there just to get that information in the, the correct area and the correct information where it needs to be. Okay, so um, for those of you, again, I'm, I'm glad we've got some folks who have signed in with their um, name, BCBA number, and their email address. Um, great following directions. Appreciate it. So, um, as you all will remember, we didn't get through um, the entire series of checklist items, and so we're starting at item number 12. And uh, so let's begin there. Um, so item number 12 addresses those psychiatric medications that are prescribed. They relate back to the target behaviors and the reason why those medications were prescribed. From a, a 
<clears throat> perspective of our compliance to the task list and compliance code, it uh, ties back to task list item G2 and I2, not to be confused with bingo, um, but looking at um, bio and medical issues and environmental issues. Um, from the compliance code, we look at effective treatment and ensuring medical um, consultation. So let's now take a look at a non-exemplar set. So we've got all these medications on the left-hand side of our, our spreadsheet or inserted spreadsheet in the plan. And then we've got what potentially the um, physician's desk reference guide may identify as the reason these medications are prescribed. Um, you know, bipolar is this whole constellation of presented behaviors. So is depression, aggression, um, pain, various types of pain. Fever is probably, you know, pretty identifiable. Cough and constipation. So those really don't identify specifically related back to the um, function, back to um, what is developed as the behavior support plan as to why a medication was prescribed or not, or what it was prescribed for in a behavioral context. So let's go on to these exemplars. So um, uh, you see the first one, and I, I'm not gonna try to um, pronounce those. The, the first medication was prescribed in June of um, 2017, and the target behavior we're addressing is pacing and repetitive behavior. So that would potentially be that target behavior. The next medication, um, uh, there is nothing identified in the plan. And, um, uh, you know, that, that presents a problem for us. The last medication, again, um, addresses uh, pacing and repetitive behaviors. You know, one of the things we need to remember as we um, take a look at medications prescribed, the idea is that we're communicating um, information potentially to the prescriber. Um, it's not that we're prescribing, but that we're communicating what changes we see in the behaviors. So I think it's important to kind of take a look at what those um, elements are. And for this one, there is no exemplar. Um, so we'll move on to the, the next item. And that's item number 13 again. It, it ties back to those um, psychotropic medications prescribed, describing the procedures of communication of the data to then the prescribing physician. So let's take a look at that non-exemplar. Um, direct care staff and Cheryl's parents um, will accompany her to the psychi psychiatric appointments. Um, the parents and direct care staff will communicate with the psychiatrist what they feel is important regarding what has been happening behaviorally with Cheryl. Direct care staff will also bring the monthly summaries from the ISP. Uh, you know, I'm, I just would like to pose a question to you guys. What are um, the issues with this process that's identified in this non-exemplar? And I'll give you guys a few minutes to answer that.
you guys responded with awesome answers. Um, I like the fact that um, Dr. Alyssa said that the um, person that's being discussed isn't um, given the opportunity to provide any input and um, decisions should be based on data. Um, and all those great things were mentioned. Um, someone said that feeling, how a person feels is not operational. So those were great answers. We're going to continue to go to the exemplar. So, um, and, you know, what we had asked before, you, you know, we created the non-exemplars and exemplars, and um, we opened the opportunity um, to all of those participating. If you've got some great ideas or great things that you would um, share with us that are exemplars or non-exemplars, we would more than welcome um, your feedback and, and some additional information. So, based on that, let's take a look at this exemplar. Um, the BCBA will um, provide graph data to all of all target behaviors. Um, the BCBA and or house manager will accompany Percy and his staff to each psychiatric appointment. In addition, the BCBA will communicate with the psychiatrist via email on a monthly basis in between those scheduled appointments, indicating a summary of behaviors and graph data. So, um, you know, I think we've covered most. Uh, we, you don't see the graph data, but the exemplar does identify that we will be communicating um, with graph data. We're going to take those to the appointments, and in between scheduled appointments, we're going to provide some additional feedback to the um, psychiatrist in regards to that summary of behaviors and graph data which ties back to um, our obligation to take a look at um, communicating effectively um, on a consistent basis with everyone. So, Item 14, if restrictive strategies are used, history and data related to less restrictive positive only strategies are described. Current ABA literature supports that the procedures are likely to be effective as designed in the plan. So we're going to take a look at the non-exemplar, giving you a little context. Jenny has recently began calling her guardians constantly, and this is a behavior we see common. Um, and the intervention that is outlined in the plan is the phone in the house will be disconnected. Staff will not allow Jenny to use their phone. I'm going to give you guys. That's okay. I want to give you guys a few minutes to provide some input as to why this is a non-exemplar.
you guys came up with some um, great answers. I love Karen's a um, answer. This is not an explanation um, for why the restriction um, is in place, um, what was done in the past. So that that's a great answer. Also, when we see restrictions, we also want to make sure that we're pairing uh, restrictions with um, teaching. And uh, Rita wants to give some additional input. Yeah, you know, I think the other thing we need to take a look at, and, you know, the whole due process um, system it is not an approval or disapproval of the restriction. The due process system ensures that the elements related to due process are in the plan and appropriate. So um, let's remove ourselves from thinking that due process approves or disapproves. The other side is, is if it's needed, um, people have generally, I've, I've had this happen, um, people will say, oh, well, we need to take it to due process before we can do it. You know, if it's a health and safety issue, if it's something that needs to be implemented, you implement it and you follow up with due process and ensure that you have those elements in place. Um, I, I think the other thing that we often forget sometimes is that this particular element, item number 14, asks us what is the literature saying about um, the intervention to be used. So, um, and I know Melantha is chomping at the bit to add something, so I'll let her talk. I just wanted to um, say that I uh, um, agree with you 100% and that um, you can always document in the behavior support plan the literature associated with your intervention. Okay, we're gonna to move to the exemplar. In the past, Enrique has used silverware to stab other people in order to escape their presence. The intervention is, while assertive communication skills and appropriate escape behavior, behaviors are being trained, silverware will be, remains in a locked drawer. As skills are acquired and physical aggression reduces to near zero level, silverware will be gradually reintroduced. Uh, Karen get a, did a good job of um, identifying that it's also important to identify what was tried historically. All right, so item number 15 pops up, and, and this is this sort of catch-all thing that we're looking for ensuring that the quality of life is improved and that we're making improvements. And what it requires in item 15 is that items four, five, seven, eight, and nine um, are in place and, and all the elements because we've noted that, um, you know, those items make up what is the quality of life. We're, we're looking at desirable behaviors, data collection, assessment of effectiveness, proactive strategies, reinforcement. Oh, and the dreaded generalization and maintenance. Ooh. Um, the task list items that this associates back to are um, J4, 5, 6, and 8, and compliance code. And the goal is to demonstrate effectiveness and I want to elaborate on item number 15 a little bit more to remind you in the, the next slide um, what those specific elements are. So the BSP or ISP goals and objectives are relate back to skills associated with the problem behavior. So you're looking at the target behaviors and the replacement behaviors. Data collection is being done and assessed the plan in the most effective manner. You're measuring not only target behaviors, but implementation. And, oh my gosh, remember to include that copy of the data collection tool. Um, items 7A and B are required. Implementation plan describes the proactive positive things you're doing to prevent the behavior. We're teaching skills specifically related to the desirable target behaviors. Again, if the target behavior is, um, the function is based on attention 
and we're not teaching the person to obtain attention appropriately, then it really isn't a match. Item number eight, strategies and instructions for reinforcement of those desirable target behaviors are included. And item number nine, the strategies to generalize, generalize and maintain. All right, hello everyone. I, uh, this is Lucas. You may remember me if you've been on this before, but I've joined uh, late, so I apologize for that. So let's talk about item number 16. So this one is about the method of performance-based training for the people that are going to be doing the implementing. So in most cases, uh, the supervising behavior analyst is not the one who's actually implementing the plan. And so it's important that there is some thought in how the plan strategies will be actually trained to the people using them. And when I say some thought, I mean thought about how we train people in ways that are consistent with our science. So through the use of practice and reinforcement and feedback. So let's take a look at something that's not an example. All staff will be trained in tools of choice strategies and implement these strategies as often as possible. A summary of the tool strategies can be found in a binder located in the residence. So this is not an example. There's a few problems here. What might be one of them? Can anyone see something that when they read it, they're like, yeah, I don't really know what that means. I don't know how to do that. Okay, great. So we got some good responses. So um, we, the a common theme across the responses is that the the description's not in, uh, specific to the individual. So one person mentioned that, well, what about if staff aren't familiar with what tools of choice are? Then saying that they'll be trained in it really means nothing to them, which is good. Two, let's say they are familiar with tools of choice and have been trained in it. What specifically do they need to do with those skills that they've been trained on with this person? Let's say this person's name is Johnny. How do they use, if you're familiar with tools of choice, pivot is a skill that they teach in stake and um, tools of choice. And there are a couple different ways that you can, or a few different ways that you can do it. How do you specifically use pivot with Johnny? That would need to be in there. And then how is that trained to staff? How will you train it to them? Um, are you just going to be like, hey, man, do you know how to use tools of choice? Cool, you got it? All right, cool, I'm gonna mark you down as being trained. Or, hey, could you read this plan real fast? All right, cool, you've been trained. No, that's probably not the way that you would train an individual and teach an individual a new skill, so that shouldn't be the way that we train staff. So let's look at an example. 
Thank you, Heike. A uh, little bit longer. So the ISO provider will designate one administrative employee within their company to take the lead in on-site monitoring. So this is a critical piece. So um, let's stop just for a second to talk about why a, a statement like that could be very important. Um, we all know that turnover of direct support professionals is a common part of life. Uh, it's it just happens all the time. And so one of the ways that you can uh, have a more effective consultative arrangement with the providers that you're working with is to say like, look, I, I'm going to need help to make sure that people are continuing to be trained on this BSP. I would like somebody from your agency who's in a up there leadership can get things done position to come with me and I'll train them to be a trainer so that they can actually train on the BSP when I'm not there. And so you get some more coverage and make that part of kind of the onboarding process for a new staff that work in that home. So um, the ISO provider is going to have somebody that will do that. And then the BSP and the ISO providers uh, representative will work to complete uh, a protocol for safety prior to direct training with all direct care staff. Staff will receive BSP training in a group setting initially. And then during the initial training, the BSP will BS, BCBA will provide verbal instruction using a PowerPoint, um, talking about all the proactive techniques, behaviors targeted for reduction, all those things that are in there. I'm not going to read the whole thing verbatim. And then on the second day of training, uh, they're actually going to get some modeling of those specific techniques. And after the modeling, they'll actually get a chance to practice and be given feedback after the practice to ensure that they actually know how to do it. Um, and then to show competency, they'll actually have to be able to do it correctly 80% of the time or more. So this is fairly comprehensive in that it, uh, sorry, I was reading something that came in. So comment was, I'd like to see who's specific on who will continue to provide the training, for example, the program manager. Uh, yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think that's fair. So having a little bit of language in there about going forward from, you know, the initial training that the program manager will have a training as new staff come on. I think that's fine. I think that the initial one would probably be the BCBA, don't you all think? Yeah. Um, but it would be good. I think, yeah, you could definitely add some language in there. But the idea is that we have a clear idea of who, uh, maybe we don't know whether it's the program manager or the BCBA, and that definitely is a good point that can be improved upon. But we know um, the folks that should be doing the training, we know what training should consist of, and we also have a criterion for what it means to have been trained on the BSP, which is critical. So you can say that, yeah, this person actually can do the plan, at least um, when we practice it. And then you could even go further and say, like, okay, they meet their initial competency of being trained on the BSP by being able to role play it, and then I'm going to do spot checks as part of my ongoing fidelity to see are they actually doing it in vivo or in the natural environment. And the, the role, I, I think, of the whole process is to build capacity. Um, you are one behavior analyst, and one behavior analyst does not a system of supports make for an individual. And you can't be there 24-7. So the goal is build the capacity of the organization to effectively meet the organization's needs and the individual's needs. Yeah, I think along with the capacity, you also build on that expectation that the agency, the residential provider, has to take some ownership of the, the plan as well so that they, there's this understanding, whether it's explicit or implicit, that uh, the, the agency's participation in making sure people are trained and are doing the plan is, is critical to the plan actually being able to be implemented. So having the agency have somebody that's being identified as being responsible for making sure people are trained kind of helps that expectation and that accountability piece for the provider to actually do the plan, which is good. And of course, there is always that need for the execution of the behavior support plan to have that ongoing clinical oversight of some nature, so getting the feedback from that person in the organization. And I think Melantha had some other things he wanted I was just going to move on to um, 17. I apologize. No That's worries, okay. It's no related. worries. Yes, it is definitely related. After people have um, responded with 80% accuracy, we just want to confirm 
that uh, once they uh, are in the natural environment, that they are implementing the plan as written. And when they are not implementing the plan as written, that there is a um, procedure in place to get folks uh, implementing the plan and responding um, at 80% or, or higher. So we're going to look at um, the non-exemplar for check uh, list item number seven. The BCBA will regularly review the plan implementation. So uh, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to respond. What are the issues with this? Most of you responded in the same way that this is the this is not specific at all. Um, regularly isn't defined. Um, there is no method to address when people are not uh, implementing the plan um, as written. So we're going to move to the uh, exemplar checklist item seven. BCBA will check each staff monthly in accordance with the checklist. Any item missed is retrained. Data is reviewed monthly with management. At the bottom of this exemplar is um, a great example of um, a task analysis of the behavior support plan, a tool that can be used uh, when you go in to do fidelity checks. Um, you can give it to the staff person so that they can see the areas. Uh, in which um, they succeeded and areas in which they may require some improvement. Um, the BCBA did a good job of looping uh, management in. Management can also provide some positive reinforcement for the staff who are at 80 uh, or higher with implementing the plan. And also, uh, if the agency has identified a master trainer, um, that person can go in after uh, the uh, BCBA has trained the person and um, provided um, and provides some additional support. Um, it also identifies how often um, the BCBA will uh, assess if the plan is being uh, implemented with fidelity. Another um, way to um, add to this is um, after the BCBA, uh, BCBA has done some retraining and the person still is not responding at 80% or higher, um, the BCBA could tape a session and um, retrain the person using a uh, video. So um, there's definitely ways to make this uh, exemplar um, more effective. I'm going to ask you guys, do you have any ideas? I'm going to give you a few minutes to um, respond.
So um, you guys had some very um, interesting answers. Um, one of the things that uh, we were discussing offline is that this um, task list, the breakdown of the behavior support plan, um, this is just one element of it. You can include the proactive uh, procedures, what the person is being um, taught, as well as um, reactive procedures. Um, but this document can be used during training as well as Fidelity, um, the board certified behavior analyst, can train three people at a time, um, um, two people at the same time, um, uh, one working with uh, Working with one person using using modeling and practice practicing, uh, while giving another staff person the opportunity to score, which will allow that person to um, discriminate on which skills are being used appropriately and effectively, and which skills require um, some additional um, work. Did you have something to read? Out? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, we have a challenge for number um, 17. The house manager will train staff and retrain anyone, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, any staff that um, does not implement the plan correctly. Is this um, an exemplar or a non-exemplar? I'll give you a few minutes to answer. So you guys all responded um, correctly. This is definitely a non-exemplar. Um, there is no method in which um, the BCBA is communicating with the family or the ISL um, about um, the data that's being reviewed. Um, there is not a breakdown of uh, the plan. Parameters are not listed. Um, there was a comment in reference to um, the issue being that the home manager is doing the training. That would only be an issue in the event that that home manager was not uh, uh, did not receive competen competency based training, um, because a lot of uh, agencies use trainer trainer. And again, as long as that person is um, been received, as long as that person has received received competency-based training and there is a system in place to ensure that that um, trainer uh, remains competent, that should not be an issue. Yeah, and just to expand on that a little bit and talk about competency-based training, keep in mind that we're talking about not only being able to com competently execute the behavior support plan, but also competently teach somebody to do the behavior support plan. So that, that those are not the same thing. So. Somebody might be able to do the plan perfectly, but then if they try to explain it to somebody, they don't know how. And so that's why part of the train the trainer model is going to be not only teaching them to do the plan, but also teaching them to teach somebody else to do the plan. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. All right. One more. Okay, so we're on to item number 18, and I alluded to this before when we were talking about um, 
psychotropic medications. Um, item 18 is the description of how the plan will be communicated to all systems, supports, and services for the individual. And, uh, you know, when looking at this, you know, one of the key elements that, that I think we we need to remember is that um, the, the task list requires us that we document the behavior services that we provide in a manner. You know, also the, the compliance code reminds us that, you know, we need to be a team player. Uh, you know, you just don't work in isolation. And I think sometimes that may be a challenge for us as a profession. Um, the other thing is, is that we, you know, identify that the effective treatments have been taking place and that we explain what's going on to those involved in the process. So um, there's a whole team associated with the individual. So let's take a look then at those exemplars and non-exemplars. And the, the first is our non-exemplar. It's that monthly summaries are completed and distribu distributed by the 15th of every month. So uh, tell me what else you might want to have in there. And I'll give you a couple moments to take a look at that and respond back. All right, so we got some really good responses from you folks. Um, appreciate it. Uh, you know, some people said, um, how are the summaries distributed? Are we being HIPAA compliant? That is a critical element, I think. Um, sometimes we get a little HIPAA. Crazy? Crazy, yeah, that's a, that's a good term, Lucas. Um, you know, I, I, I'm amazed at uh, emails I get. I have this person who, and then, you know, I should be able to know about the, the information, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's an okay start. Recipients, um, how will the um, initial BSP, that, that's a great thing also. How are we going to share the initial information? Um, distribution method identified. And, and, you know, we were talking a little bit offline, and I'm going to throw it over to Melantha because she brought up a, a great uh, example outside of, um, our community of behavior analysis services. I was just sharing with them that um, our medical system uh, now uses my chart, which allows um, doctors to graph um, uh, medical data, such as labs, and uh, make database decisions. Uh, the system allows for all of your uh, medical treatment teams to review uh, medical results. Um, so I, 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 I love the fact that there's a system in place that will allow my um, 
results of labs to be communicated to all of the doctors who are working to uh, keep me medically stable. You know, I think the other thing that um, that ties back to to Melantha is the fact that um, when we cross providers, that we identify who those folks are, that's your primary care, that's mm -hmm. your endocrinologist, whoever, and those are the people who get access to the information. So I think the medical community has a much better way to, to keep people informed. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we had documentation systems for plans that we could share just like that, but we're not quite there. Well, and, and you may, so uh, Therap is a popular uh, program, you know, electronic medical record program that some providers use and so if you are a provider that uses Therap or you work with agencies who have Therap or another system, that may be worth having that conversation about if there is the ability to um, leverage the capabilities of that program to kind of make it easier on yourself. So for example, if you can, if you can create your documentation, your summary, your note, whatever, and, and have that immediately distributed or immediately viewable to other people that you indicate is on a treatment team, then that is a perfect system because somebody can essentially see kind of the progress of the plan in real time because as soon as you enter something, they can see it. And I don't, I don't know 100% that Therap can do stuff like that. I do know that they can run reports. And so, again, taking stock of what current system you use and how you can leverage that technology. Uh, email distribution lists are another thing. If you know all the people on the treatment team and just making an email group that you blast out the – the uh, report to is another thing that could be time saving, so you're not having to search around to find out who do I send this to again. Um, and so, just thinking about those things that can kind of uh, make it a little bit more efficient because you're not you're not getting paid the time that you're trying to uh, figure out who you're supposed to send it to and distribute it. So, the the more efficient you can make it, the better. So now let's look at that exemplar, if we could, please. So. I, and I'm not going to read through this, but, you know, the monthly summaries completed and distributed as follows. And, and in this case, we have the residential provider, the day program provider, primary care physician, psychiatrist, guardian. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's often forgotten is, you know, share the information on what's going on with the individual so that they know, um, you know, have the opportunity to sit down with them or have somebody to sit down with them to actually say, you know, here's where we started, here's where you are now, here's where you'd like to go, right? Um, and I think it, it helps the person feel as though they have some level of control in their life and we're also building their capacity to understand, hey, what those people, you know, that behavior analyst, he comes over or my staff do this with me. You know, what a great way to empower someone. All right. Let's look at item number 19. So this one is concerned about plan implementation and whether or not things are effective. So if, it, if the plan's been implemented, strategies have been modified and adjusted in a timely manner as indicated by data. So let's look at something that's not an example. VSP was implemented on 2-1-19, and on 2-2-19, a new reinforcement plan was implemented in addition to a revised set of proactive preventative procedures. So this does not meet our criteria. What is missing? It's a four-letter word. What, what's missing? Yeah, data. There's no data. Okay, so what? You did some new reinforcement plan on the second. At one day after implementation, like was there a reason for that? How did how did that go? Awesome. Um, so let's look at an example. So here we have a graph. I like graphs. And so we can see that the initial we have one baseline data point. It's not great, but you know we got a little baseline to compare. We got BSP training that happened on that first phase change line. And we can see that the solid line with the dots is self-injurious behavior. So uh, we're going to assume that it's defined elsewhere. You typically don't define your, uh, the, the behavior on the graph. So let's assume for, the, for this example that it's defined elsewhere and we know what that means. We see that it's still going up after the initial BSP implementation. And the replacement behavior, asking for headphones, 
um, is up a little bit, but you know, definitely not where it needs to be and definitely not in relation to the direction that self injurious behavior is going. Okay, cool. So we got another phase change line where we did some retraining. And now we see the self injurious behavior have a steep decline and we start seeing an increase in that replacement behavior that retraining. This indicates that we made changes um, based on data. You maybe could make the argument that the, the change wasn't as timely as it should have been. Um, if you remember from coursework, you only need three data points to comp compute a trend. And so if you were going to make a change based off those three data points, you would have made that change a little bit earlier. However, it's not extremely beyond those initial three data points. And so it's fairly timely. It did produce an effective change. I would definitely say that this is an example of um, indicating that the plan is effective, which means that you made modifications and changes in a timely manner based on data. Also, the graph's pretty. Okay, so uh, can we interrupt just one second because I noticed we had a comment that no, you can go forward. Uh, Heike, there was a comment about is Google Docs okay? So this goes back to um, 18. So let's pause for a second and go back to 18. And we we're talking about um, dis distributing. You don't have to go back, Heike. This is for distributing information to people. And Google Docs, um, I think, could be okay, but here are some considerations that need to be. Uh, kind of figure it out before you use Google Docs. So Google Documents is not HIPAA compliant. Therefore, any identifiable information in there is exposed and compromised. So that doesn't mean that you can't use Google Docs. What it means is you can't put identifiable information in there, and so you're going to have to get a little bit creative on how you display things. So for example, you're probably going to have to have a separate key that people have they, that they can use to identify who the person is. And if there are contextual things in the graph that are identifiable, you'll have to do some kind of uh, creative arranging of those as well. And so the, the question then becomes, is that still beneficial? So if, if are people having to work so hard to kind of translate from the redacted information to the actual information that it makes Google Docs not the right thing to use? If that's not a problem and you really just they just have to know that the code word for Johnny is uh, client one and so they see client one and oh that's Johnny and the data doesn't have any contextual information that would be revealing that's probably fine uh, but those are things you need to think about so making sure that whatever you have on Google Docs is not protected uh, and could be breached so you don't want to have identifiable identifiable information sorry thanks for um, catching that Lucas Greatly appreciate it. All right, item number 20, our last item. If plan has been implemented, fidelity of implementation data is provided and indicates adequate implement, implementation fidelity. So we're going to take a look at this non exemplar. All right. Huh. This is very in, a very interesting gra uh, graph. C's um, staff, um, this is data for the staff who are implementing um, the behavior support plan. Uh, in the month of July, we see that um, they people were responding and implementing it 100%. And then um, as we look at maintenance of the plan in the last month of October, we see that it drops below 80%. Um, there is no indication as to how uh, the BCBA plans to address um, the fact that people are not maintaining the skills they learn during training. And um, there is also um, not a, uh, like I said, in the month of um, September, October, um, um, there's not uh, a consistent res uh, responding with 80% or um, higher. Another thing is even, let's say that last data point was above 80%, so let's say it's 82%, and let's say you said 80% is the cutoff. Um, I, would, I would still argue that you should be concerned about implementation just by looking at which way the data is going. So it may still be above 80%, Again, we're saying that it is, but it's still going down. 
consistently. You have three data points that are uh, on a decrease. So that would still be concerning to me. Okay, we're going to look at the exemplar. Now, this is definitely a um, beautiful graph. Um, the graph highlights uh, the goal of having folks respond at 80% uh, or higher. It identifies when the initial training um, was implemented, uh, um, the, um, not the initial training, when they were going into check fidelity. And uh, it also uh, addresses um, the decrease in the maintenance in the month of June. Um, staff are, uh, need to be retrained, and then we see a, a higher rate of um, responding. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So here is our challenge question. Um, record review indicates that staff are implementing the plan as written. So is this a exemplar or non-exemplar? And give me some feedback um, as, as to why. how. Yes, as to why. Thank you. All right, you guys definitely did a great job with responding. Um, everyone identified this as a non-exemplar um, because there is no data present. Um, you can also consider um, when you uh, create um, your fidelity sh um, sheet, uh, which is basically a task analysis of the plan that includes the proactive procedures uh, skill acquisition and how to respond when things are uh, beginning to escalate to a crisis um, of identifying a, a master trainer and uh, the BCBA can go in and um, do the fidelity checks and some probing and the master trainer can also go in and do some uh, fidelity checks and you can compare the data. Um, to see if you guys are getting the same responses and um, celebrate successes as well as address concerns, because you may come, you may experience a situation where people are responding differently for for uh, the employer, um, for the person that they, the master trainer who's employed by um, the agency that they work for, mm -hmm. as well as um, you, as you being the BCBA. And and again, that kind of facilitates that ownership of the the support by the agency whose staff are implementing it. So if they're having to have a supervisor actually, uh, shocker, provide supervision on what staff are doing during the day, um, I think that's a good thing. And then if you can set that up in a way that it's positive, so you and the, uh, train, the, the trainer, master trainer, have a range for a way that you're going to uh, positively notice when staff are doing the right thing that hopefully is reinforcement, 
um, that's even better because now you're now you're making it supervision and also it's a, a relationship building tool so that supervision is not aversive because we that's we don't want supervision to be aversive so we don't want monitoring the fidelity of the plan to be something that people try to avoid we want it to be rewarding and reinforcing and so um, I think you could do two things so you could help the supervisor actually provide supervision and you can continue to get some more data on somebody that you can't be there every single day and so I think there really is no con there's no there's no con against kind of having that somebody at the agency take that responsibility to uh, help train the plan and help oversee the plan when you're not there. And I also want us to consider um, when we are addressing um, um, staff who are not responding with 80% of or, or higher accuracy when, when you go in to do the probing for Fidelity to um, consider a uh, multi-level system to retrain them so it doesn't always look like um, you're doing, uh, you're going in and uh, modeling, practicing, um, and um, and the behavior skills training. But um, like I said earlier, consider using some uh, video, allowing them to b observe other staff and giving feedback. Um, just having a um, a multi-tiered approach to uh, training for fidelity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have can, we successfully gotten through all of the elements. Uh, if you've been here the whole time through all four episodes, kudos to you. You have come a long way with us. We have some time budgeted still, so we have plenty of time to talk um, questions or concerns. Uh, so do we want to, folks, do colleagues, do we want to open it up? Oh, sure. Discussion? I think we open it up to, to some discussion. You know, one of the things that was asked in regards to the, the last question or, or um, the last element of the um, checklist for the, the plan is, um, you know, and I, I think we've addressed it um, before, is, you know, is there an example of a good task list or fidelity checklist? And, you know, as we've mentioned, you know, that's a function of what's in the plan. You know, there may be sections that, and this is a really good example of building capacity is, you know, maybe the PBS curriculum of the organization is that tools of choice. You know, does a behavior analyst have to do the fidelity checks on tools of choice? Not at all. You know, that's inter-organizational. So those are really some important things um, as we move forward that, Elements of the fidelity may be addressed by other people. I, I think another thing that might be helpful just to kind of change the frame of reference or perspective when you're trying to approach the, the fidelity for staff piece is approaching the staff as your, your primary client. So trying to determine what is the, what's the terminal behavior you want to see out of staff. So let's say you're working with a learner and you want your, your whatever the terminal skill you're working on, you're, you're working on MANS or something, or tax or, or whatever it is, or requests for uh, items that they want specifically, and it's not just all MANS. And so thinking about what is it that you want them to do when they're done, and then breaking out step by step how you would teach them to do that. And I think if you approach staff in that same way, by figuring out what do you want them to do, which is the behavior support plan, and then breaking down how you would teach them to do that, I think that leads to having a fidelity checklist that you can use to, to monitor ongoing. And so it's really killing two birds with one stone. So I think that that's probably um, the best way to do it. And again, it, it, it makes sure that you're able to teach somebody to do it. Uh, it looks like we had a question about how do you receive the tools of choice training? The tools of choice training is provided free by each regional office, they have um, a group of people called the Agency Tiered Support Consultants. You may have heard of them as the BRT. They got renamed. Um, they have classes monthly that are free. I think they uh, prioritize agencies that have joined the Tiered Support Network. However, they typically always have room for more people. And if you have an, a specific interest, there's probably an arrangement that can be made, or even better, if your agency would like to become a tiered agency, that would be fantastic too.
and you'll you might notice some pauses in our interactions you guys are, are throwing a lot of good questions at us so give us an opportunity to kind of read through those so would you like me to read the staff have a great deal of difficulty yeah okay so uh, so we had a comment and comment and question staff have a great deal of difficulty with appropriate training our BSP trainings tend to be cattle call events with 10 to 12 plans reviewed back to back with uh, brand new employees who have little experience with individuals for uh, training for updated BSPs with current staff the difficulty comes from staff who have been mandated and for folks that don't know what mandated means that's a great thing that um, anybody who's worked direct care at a state facility knows is when you get to work extra, where you don't get to go home when it's time to go home and you get to work extra. And so difficulty for training people, updating them is they've been mandated and they can't, can't stay past their shift. So they basically have, it, have hit their cap on how many hours they can work. And they also have a lot of high turnover um, which makes training a never-ending carousel. Yes, all those things are true and difficult. So I guess, um, and I, I'd love to hear what you all think about it. Do you want to start? Um, I will definitely start um, because a lot of this relates back to leadership and ident identifying some of these barriers with the leadership of the agency um, that you're working with, um, a lot of things that have been done in other um, area, areas is because um, a lot of people get mandated for um, for various reasons. And so um, training at the change of shift and requiring that, um, like the, the um, I, I don't want to mess up names, but the home manager or the person that's responsible for the home go in uh, and be relieved of paperwork um, and identifying other folks that can go in and work the home while direct, direct care um, folks are being trained um, for that hour or so um, while there is um, changing of the shift. Um, so a lot of those things just have to be planned out with um, the administrator of the ISL or whatever facility that you're um, working, working in. Uh, we talked earlier about identifying um, master training, master training. So um, having a specific position trained um, on the plan, so that um, if that person from that position leaves, whoever fills that person place will be retrained, and they're responsible for training um, the direct care professionals, um, so that it is not. Um, labor intensive for the folks who are responsible for uh, behavioral services. So those are some of the thoughts that I that came to my mind when you read that, Lucas. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think the other thing is is that you know, as behavior analysts, we are creating systems of support. So it, it pulls in that organizational behavior management side of our skill set mm -hmm. that we should really hone. Um, because you as the behavior analyst can't do it on your own. The other thing is, is that, you know, without building the capacity of the provider, however that looks, whether it's the uh, habilitation center or a residential provider or day program provider, um, you know, our skills are not being best utilized to um, address the needs of the system support that would really, in the long term, help support the individual more effectively. Yeah, so I, that's that's kind of where I, I was going, or I was thinking, uh, Rita, and just to kind of have a hypothetical situation. So let's say we're talking about an agency that has behavior services built in. The behavior analyst has the ability to have input on new employees that come in. And so we're talking about just a, a single organization. And we can start with that as an example, and then we can branch out from that. Um, so uh, one of our colleagues from Tennessee has a, a pretty, uh, it's not a hard limit, but he, he believes that a behavior support plan, and I tend to agree, should be about five pages or so. Um, and he, and 
he famously, or well, famous to me anyway, he talks about his, his mentor when he was coming up um, would, would uh, kind of continuously hand his plan back to him to revise until he got it down to five pages. And so you might be thinking, wow, how the heck do you ever get a behavior plan that's only five pages because we have so much stuff to cover? And my question to, to I mean, my, my challenge question to you is, do you really have that much to cover and should you be covering it all in the behavior support plan? And what I mean by that is, and this goes to straight to the heart of what Rita was talking about with the organizational structure. So if you think about, if anybody's familiar with like school-wide positive behavior support or if you're familiar with tiered support and that tiered model, what we need is a good foundation that everybody needs to know how to do stuff um, like something like the tools of choice curriculum. That's a really a curriculum about, in general, how you should treat another person. And so if you can get somebody competent in tools of choice, as an example, or some other uh, competency-based PBS curriculum, you know, you can probably take some of that stuff out of your behavior support plan. Like you shouldn't need to uh, make the person's life good, increase their quality of life in the BSP, because that should be covered under the agency's universal strategies, and their life should just be kind of good. And so your BSP can really just focus on what do I need to teach this person? And how can I make this, uh, this plan as concise as possible? And what do I mean by concise? I mean, you don't need a lot of narrative. You need about this, if this happens, this is what you do. When this happens, this is what you do. Instead of having, you know, you'll know that Johnny is angry by the way that, you know, minimize the amount of words that you need. You just want to try to get across the information that's important Sometimes the, it's easy to kind of arrange it in two columns. The, fir, the left column is if this happens, and the right column is then do this. So thinking about that, about how you can make it as, as efficient as possible. And then finally, um, I would ask to, to consider whether or not the BSP at current is trying to hit too many things at once. And so there might be an opportunity which would save in training and also complexity of only focusing on that most critical piece of what uh, needs to change in the person's repertoire and then building from that. And so you might have, can I share an example BSP? Um, so we get that question a lot. Uh, we certainly could share a, I think Dr. Rogers is working on a template. Our hesitation for sharing an example BSP is because uh, any example BSP is only uh, the best BSP for the person that it was written for. And the tendency when examples of plans get shared is that you start seeing a lot of plans that look very close to the example, which may or may not be good plans when um, applied to a specific person. Does, does anybody want to help me with that? Because I think I didn't explain that very well. No, I have to, to agree with you, Lucas, that um, w we often get this example perpetuated, and it, it's like a cookie cutter. Oh, this is the special sauce. This is the secret sauce. This is the recipe. Well, uh, you know, if we're aligning with home and community-based services and waiver supports, then this should be an, oh, my gosh, individual plan. So, uh, you know, I think we miss the mark if we expect that every plan is the same. And, and you know, I, I am also challenged when I look at um, plans from the same behavior provider in that it's like, oh, my gosh, I think I've read this plan before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're talking about a totally different person. You know, I think Lucas also um, – indicated that you have to really capitalize on what is that one pivotal thing that will change this person's life the most significantly. You know, if you were to write me a behavior support plan, you know, you might as well be, you know, Reader's Digest or, you know, that this long war and peace evolution because I got lots of problems, don't we all? Um, and you really need to address what are the things that will really change this person's quality of life the most significantly mm -hmm. um, by targeting those behaviors and addressing that skill. And what we, so um, while we probably won't share a completed example BSP, what we can share is we can share a, a recent talk that we gave at APBA and, and part of that panel presentation was the, the gentleman from Tennessee 
did a section specifically on how to make behavior support plans more concise and has uh, a lot of examples of how things could be pared down. And then one of our participants today actually had a fantastic contribution where uh, he indicated that they, they have a larger BSP, but they have within that cheat sheet are modules that they pull out so that they can have focus areas. And so um, when doing training or when doing references, you really only got to have that part in order to know what you need to do. And if you think about kind of a BSP being a growing document, you could start off with module one that hits the, the, the highest thing, and then you, you can successively add modules onto the end of it. And again, you're only pulling out the piece that you need. You have it all in there, but you're making it as, as efficient as possible. Um, and you're not having to have people go through lots of material that's not really relevant. And I, I you know, the, the checklist requirements are, there are 20 items on our checklist for behavior support plans. Does the staff need to know all that? Um, probably not. I mean, you can start with your base and, and I'll call it implementation portion. And, you know, that's what staff needs to know. Do you want to review the data? Definitely. You know, you want to give the opportunity to, as we've demonstrated throughout elements of the, the checklist, you know, we want to give staff feedback. Boy, you, you're doing really good on this part of your implementation. Um, let's work on this. You know, that fidelity. You also want to, you know, let the staff know that what they're doing is having an impact on this person's life by sharing the graphs with them at a, a monthly meeting or a staff meeting so that they know that one, the plan is working, and two, what they're doing is having an impact on this person's quality of life. Okay, so we had a, a question about what, uh, let's see, I can't find it now. Um, oh, what should providers be ready to get from the Behavioral Review Committee? What is considered typical from the Review Committee? Okay, great question. So we have a standard form because, you know, we're the state and we like standard forms for everything. So we have a standard form that you should receive that indicates who the person was, why they're being reviewed, who was there, who was uh, from the committee and who was there from the team. It'll indicate what items from the checklist were present or not present. And then it'll have an area for some priority recommendations that you will get that's kind of a summarized kind of distillation of what was discussed in the meeting that's really just focusing on a few key areas, not a whole bunch. And that's the typical thing that you can get. Um, we don't typically, just uh, without it being requested, send uh, specific feedback for every single item to a behavior provider, not because it's a secret, 
but because generally it's kind of overwhelming to get that, that much feedback. Um, however, all the committee members as they're scoring the plans are providing specific comments on each item in a way that uh, they wouldn't have a problem with another person seeing it. So we, we, we review a plan uh, with the idea that the provider can look at it and see the comments. And so if a behavior provider would want to see more than just those summarized priority thoughts and recommendations, they can see essentially whatever they want. They can see uh, a summary of uh, some additional summary of what some recommendations are. They can see the specific comments by item for the whole committee. Like they can see whatever they want. So we're willing to provide however much information is useful for the provider. But as a general rule of thumb, we're only providing like a prioritized list of um, recommendations based on kind of what the committee feels is most critical to, to, to kind of uh, work on immediately. And, uh, you know, one of the things I we open up is, uh, you know, if you want it all, we'll, we'll give it to you. There's no secret. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we want to present transparency at every end so that, you know, if you want the feedback, it's there. Um, one of the things I do is, as opposed to sending all the, the checklist sheets, I do a summary of each um, checklist element so that we don't have redundant information and that it's more succinct and bulleted. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and I guess the, a follow-up question for the group is, um, if you have experienced that, what are your thoughts about it? If you haven't experienced receiving a recommendation or a summary from the committee, um, hearing me describe it, Maybe in artfully, but what do you have? What What are your thoughts when you hear that? Does that sound like something that would be helpful to you if you were to get it? Does that sound like something you would support if you were to sit on a committee? What are your thoughts? Oh, so one uh, comment was, you know, giving people additional ideas and suggestions for improvement. You know, we should relish the feedback. Uh, you know, essentially we work in isolation a lot of times. And, you know, the, the interactions we have are great here on this um, venue of the Behavior Support Review Committee um, series, but, you know, you personally, how much feedback do you get from other behavior analysts? Do you have the time to seek that out? You know, one of, a lot of the feedback I've gotten from the review committee folks is, you know, yes, it is a challenge to um, potentially be part of the review committee, but many of the um, reviewers have said how much they've learned about what other things they could have in plans, what other ways to present plans, and also how to do some real effective critical feedback. Um, 
to the um, our, our peers. So I think those are, are really essential elements of you know what we are chartered to do as behavior analysts and and that whole process of peer review. Some of the athletes are providing reinforcer for good plans. Um, I'm I'm maybe a steak dinner. Does that sound okay? Chocolate? I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to assess what what uh, likely you know, to be a reinforcer. I, I the other thing I think that uh, you know hopefully part of the reinforcement uh, that you're getting is the fact that um, uh, you know and and I've given some some pretty positive um, feedback because one of my challenges and and I think my associates here also are challenged is that um, for ISPs uh, the opportunity to have a safety crisis plan included in that is you know it's like oh my gosh you guys did awesome you have a safety crisis plan and i am the first one to jump up and down and and yell and scream because i love the fact that teams have safety crisis plans you know i uh, my next question is so how's that going and there was dead silence when i asked the question but they had it they had but it they had it and and i was so happy that they had it you know, and it's all, you know, behavior change is incremental. So we made the first step. They had a safety crisis plan. Um, part of their action plan is, so let's take a look at the data and see what's working and not working. So. And then I also, you know, the, the, the atmosphere, which is a not behavioral thing to say, but the atmosphere of the committee is, is as collaborative and as pos positive as we can possibly make it. And so I don't know if you've ever been in a room full of behavior analysts that are nerding out over your cool things that you're doing, but at least for me, that's pretty freaking reinforcing. And so I think some of that comes with just the, like, it's, it's social. It's social um, acknowledgement. It's the kudos that you're getting. I think for most of us um, as professionals, it's, it, it is reinforcing to have somebody validate that you're doing a good job. And so having a room full of people that are uh, picking out the parts where you're doing a really good job and then also having a little bit more to uh, add to help you along on something that you're concerned about. So you might bring a plan to a committee and say, I'm just struggling with this generalization piece. Like, I just can't see it. What do you all see? And we, and so I think that, I think that's reinforcing, I think the, the, the positive and the kind of collaborative atmosphere kind of lends itself to just kind of some typical social reinforcement, even though chocolate would be awesome. And I'm not ruling it out, it could it could make an appearance. It, it may not, but it could. It may not, but it could. But it may not. Uh, you know, I think the other side that um, you know, in talking to various committee members, is the fact that you know sometimes as a behavior analyst, we just want a a sounding board. And I know some of the behavior analysts on the committee have said, you know, could we just you know, if I need some help when I'm developing this behavior support plan. Could I just round up some people? And that, you know, mm -hmm. gosh, what a way to to really have some collaboration. Like as Lucas mentioned, boy, I'm kind of struggling with how do I look at generalization and maintenance for this person. And and sometimes when you're in the the beginnings of the behavior support plan, it's like I have no idea how we're going to generalize and maintain. Um, and to kind of get some support to help us along the way, it, you know, whether it's, you know, sending an APB out to the, the committee saying, hey, everybody, I need some help on generalization and maintenance for this skill. Anybody got any articles, anything they've used before? Uh, you know, I think that's a great venue to be able to do that. All right. I think we've covered it. Uh, again, um, uh, we greatly appreciate everyone's continued participation. Um, unless there are other issues um, or questions that you all have, um, as a reminder, you need to um, indicate you are signing off to garner the CEUs associated with this last, uh, not last in the, the whole series maybe, but the last for this current series of the Behavior Support Review Committee. 
Um, then we'll uh, see you next time. We are also looking at some podcasts and other ways to um, help you be more successful as behavior analysts. Thank you.